This summer, we want to do this. Perceptive summer of 2022. So this is just where I'm going myself. I'm just, Lord, I want to perceive better. I'm going to explain what that is. But I hope that you will go on that journey with me because I'm going on that journey Monday through Sunday. So I'm hoping to maybe like throw something at you today and in the coming weeks that will help you go on that journey with me Monday through Sunday, every Monday through Sunday, summer 2022. And so the first thing I want to talk about is um, perception. Okay, so look, look at this. There's this great quote I heard from a guy named Stephen Covey. He says, we think we see the world as it is, but in truth, we see the world as we are. We think we see the world as it really is, but in truth, we see the world so often through who we are, okay? Do you know, look at these, these, these are sunglasses, Jerry. I am a failure. How do you see the world? Or, next one. Maybe you can help me with these, Eric, because this isn't unlovable. Or growth is impossible. There's so many different ways we can look at the world and how we perceive things has a huge effect on how we live, doesn't it? You with me? And so this is our perception. So here's the definition of perception. Perception is the skill of observing and understanding. How do I see the world and how do I understand the world? And then there's a second thing, and this is, this is what perceptions do to us. Our perceptions, how we see the world and understand the world becomes what's called our paradigm. I know two kind of big words, but they're simple. And what is a paradigm? A paradigm is just from the Greek word that means pattern. So our perceptions, how we see the world, affects our paradigm, which becomes our life. You ever been in a rut of a paradigm? Eating 10 rolls <laughs> at lunchtime and then just needing a nap? Paradigm. So your, your paradigms are derived from your perceptions. Great example of this was a friend of mine, two friends of mine, they went bu bungee jumping. Again, this was when I was in college. And I didn't get to go there, but I got to watch the video. The first one got to the edge. He was all tied up and he stood on the edge of the bridge like this. So that the, the, and he just looked down. And as you watched, you just began to see him shaking. And he stood there, and he stood there, and he stood there. And everybody was like, go, Eric, go, Eric, go, Eric. He, did, he did, couldn't jump. <laughs> the other friend got all strapped up, and he, uh, he stepped back to, like, the other side of the bridge. And he looked up. So one of them was looking at how he was going to fall to his death. The other one stepped back, looked up, and got excited about how he was going to fly into this experience. He just ran, and you see him jump, and then, he, then you see he sees, and he just, uh, while he's falling down, he just panics. But, but it was so amazing how they, you know, they just both went into the same situation with different perceptions, and it affected how they did it, like how they went into it. Yeah, this is good, isn't it? You guys are being touched right now. Come on, paradigms, patterns of our life defined by how we perceive the world that we live in. A number of years ago, I was in Ireland, I was in Port Leash, I had just moved here and we had some friends come visit, some, some of my parents' best friends, older friends, and we were driving I think we were on the Port Leash Strat Valley Road, 
And all of a sudden, while we were driving, we all the windows rolled down, and this smell came seeping through into the car. And you look around, and everybody's like, they're rolling up their windows as fast as they can, and then they realize it's going to stay in here now, so they rolled back the windows down. And we were all like, that is so disgusting. That is so strong. What is that? My dad's like, that's slurry. They're spraying it all over the fields right now. And I looked over at my dad's friend, and he said, that's the smell of money. Your perception will affect your paradigm. He grew up as a kid on the farm, and so for him, that smell was cash in his hands. That meant money. Isn't that amazing? How it changed you in perception can affect the whole pattern. You know, he, he's going to love it, so he's going to get all that he can out of that. Let's look at this. How, how do how our perceptions change things? This is a simple graphic. How we see affects what we do and leads to what we receive. How we see affects what we do and then leads to what we will receive. So how we see is really our paradigms and patterns. What we do is our practices, which are affected by that. And then what we get are really just the results of those things because they're all interconnected. If you want to make minor changes in your life, you should work on your, what you do. But if you want to make massive changes in your life, you should work on how you see. You can make little incremental changes by adjusting what you do. But if you can change how you see, it can make massive changes for your life. First the natural, then the spiritual. You, you know, you've probably heard this. You show somebody an apple, and you say, what is this? And one person says, an apple. And then you show it to another person, what do you see? They say, I see an orchard. What do you see? I see an apple. What do you see? I see an orchard because there's so much within this thing. But do you see it? Sometimes we see something and we just see, that's just a uh. And God says, no, that's a uh. So opportunities for outcomes are linked to your observation. <laughs> I love all the O's. Okay. So we want to talk about a new way of seeing. Say, say with me, I want to see. I want to see. I mean, I want to see. I'm serious. Summer 2022, I want to see differently. I pray. Like, I know this is just a Sunday morning on the beginning of June. But really, this could, like, transform your whole life. This is actually something I've been kind of journeying on for years for myself, this, this little talk that I'm talking about, because it's so transformative and it's an ongoing journey. But I'm praying that God will just bring us to a whole different level that can really change, really change you, change your family, change your experience of your life, change your joy, change your peace, so many things. If you can enter into this, and I believe that, you know, God has greater things for you. If you can break through today, break through. All right. A new way of seeing. Science is observation, right? Science is observation. Did you know that faith is observation? They say science has to do with observing what you can see. And I would propose that faith has to do with observing what you can't see. And both of them, actually, I think that's kind of like a stark distinction because I think they both really deal with actually both of them. Science deals with observing things you can see and things you can't see. And faith deals with things you can see and not see. 
they both kind of intermixed, but that's just a helpful distinction sometimes. So science observes the seen and faith observes the unseen. And my task today would be to inspire us to new things in God. And you can only get to new things with God through faith. Would you say that with me? I'm only going to get to, well, let's see. How would you, just agree with me. You don't say it with me. I'm only going to get to new things with God by faith. Without faith, I, you know, if you want to be where you are and stay where you are and just put your feet up, then don't worry about it. Just, you know, take a nap. Just put your feet up. Relax and close your eyes. <laughs> but if you want to move into new things, then it's going to require seeing differently. It's, it's amazing. Faith is amazing. God always is going to require faith. I think we're searching for this moment where we don't need any faith anymore. Like, now I know. Now I got it all figured out. But do you know what? God's always going to require us to journey with faith. It's just the way he works. <laughs> you have to ponder that one for a while. So I want to go new places with God. But in order to get there, I got to have faith. I got to begin to see things different. So faith is seeing, it's a way of seeing. This is what Paul says in Corinthians. I love this because he's saying, look at things that you can't see. <laughs> you ever tried to look at something you can't see? Listen to him. He says, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. There is a reality that we don't physically see that is more real than the reality that we think is so real because that reality is temporary, but the other reality is eternal. Woo! So he goes on in the next chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So this journey with God is, it's a journey of seeing when you don't see. Thank you, Lord. That's, that's exciting. What an, an adventure that God invites you into. Don't, don't, um, don't shut me off because of your experiences today. Don't shut me off. Listen to what God might say to you. Let's look at this verse from Proverbs. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but it's the glory of kings to search things out. The way that I wanted to phrase this is, can you show that next slide? Heaven's hidden is not heaven's denial. Just because you don't see it right when you want to see it doesn't mean you can't get to see it. Just because something is not dropped in your lap doesn't mean it's not meant for you. Have you ever been involved um, at Easter time with the kids' Easter egg hunts? And I know we would do this sometimes. The parents, they go and hide the eggs in different places in the garden. Why do they do that? Do they do that because they want those eggs and sweeties to rot and just stay where they are? They hide them so that their children will go and find them. That's what God does. Just because he doesn't drop it in your lap doesn't mean it's not yours to have.
This is what Jesus said, Matthew eleven twenty five. He said at that time, Jesus, he just declared it. I thank you, Father. He was like praying, Father, thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to children. You hid them from those who think they know it all and revealed it to those who were just on the search. So, we're called not just to observe. Like, where is it? Come on. I don't see it. We're called to engage. Go find it. God hid it. I can find it. There are things that he has hidden that we're meant to find. He desires you to perceive so you're not made to just look at it you're made to live it <laughs> you know i was thinking on youtube there's a difference between content consumers that just watch and content who creators who create and so content creators engage in it they don't just like they don't just watch the travel vlogs they go and buy a sailboat So there's plenty of Christians that watch, just watch the video log. But God really, he invites us to buy a sailboat. Okay. So th this is the application now. I want to share with you four things that, these came from a book I read years ago, uh, Scattered Servants. Just some thoughts from a guy named Alan Scott that have helped me kind of in this area of, of observing and endeavoring to walk by faith, to see differently so that I can live differently. And the, okay, so <clears throat> do you remember the story? I'm sure you remember this story. It's in Matthew chapter 14. It's actually in every one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's one of the only stories that's in all of them. And I think the reason is because it's so important. But it's this moment where Jesus is with his disciples, and it says he goes out to the countryside. And they're tired, and the, the crowds see that they're going out there, so they follow them. And so there's this massive crowd of like 5,000 people plus, and so Jesus has compassion on him. He just does all these miracles of healing them. And then the evening comes. So they've been with him like all day. Evening comes and the disciples are like, Jesus, can you just send them away because they need to get food? <laughs> send them to the villages around so they can buy bread. And Jesus says to the disciples, no, you give them something to eat. It's your opportunity. That's nice. That's like the that's like the sound of those little baby. You know the babies going to sleep. Dun, 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 dun. Some of you are enjoying that. <laughs> so they're out here in this wilderness, and Jesus says to them, "You give them something to eat." Hmm. They don't need to go away you give them. So the first one is, the awesome is in the awkward. Just what you wanted to hear. <laughs> you don't always have to be an awkward Christian. Listen, sometimes God lets you use your amazing gifting, that is, you know, talent and skill. He lets you do that. But there are times where the awesome is found in the awkward because it's in the place where you don't feel enough that God can enter in and become enough. So Philip, Philip, I just think he's he's just this like great administrator. Like great, he just knows finance. And he's like, Jesus, 200 days wages would not fee be enough to feed all these people. Don't you know? You know, like bread is two euro and 49 cents now at Lidl. How are we going to feed all these people? 
we do not have enough, Jesus. You ever been there? Is that you? So Jesus, in this moment, he was teaching his followers how to walk in the realm of impossibilities. When things become impossible, according to your spreadsheet, what do you do? It, it begins where you feel inadequate because it becomes God's opportunity. Number two, the big is in the small. Many of us miss what we have because it doesn't look like very much. God might be wanting you to see what you have, but you're spending all this time looking at what you don't have. He just wants you to see what you have because he can use what you already have. You think you need something that belongs to them when you already got what he has given you for what you need to do with him. Philip's like, Lord, we don't have any money. Even if we did, 200, 200 days wages, you know, 20,000 euros wouldn't be enough to feed this crowd. What are you thinking? But then there's another disciple. That's Philip. There's another disciple, Andrew. And he's like, uh, Jesus, we got this boy. He's got five loaves, two fish. Uh, but that's probably nothing, right? Jesus is like, what? There. That's it. But Jesus, you're crazy. <laughs> you know. You know it's not enough, right? Where are you living? Jesus says, bring him here. Bring it to me. Bring what you got to me. You know, because what you have can grow. That apple could become an orchard. The thing that starts so small. This is how the kingdom of God works. We think, oh, come on, give me the, give me the 20 acres with trees full. And God says, here's an apple. This is how the kingdom of God works. We're looking for a super miracle. And God said, here's an apple. This will change you if you begin to walk out these things that Jesus taught us. You know, you, you take a step by faith today. Hey, Lord, I got an apple. Hey, Lord, I'm putting a seed in the ground. Hey, Lord, here I am. I'm digging a hole. Hey, Lord, it's nap time. Hey, Lord, I'm, I'm pouring some water on it. Hey, Lord, it's a sunny day. Thank you. Hey, Lord, I want to go to bed now. Hey, Lord, I got this other seed I'm going to throw in there. Hey, Lord, you see? The big is in the small. Focus on what you've got, not on what's missing. The fruit is where you feel the fear, number three. <laughs> Anybody f afraid ever? My mom has this great sticker, on, or she used to, I don't know if she still has it, on her refrigerator. It says, do one thing every day that scares you. Oh, that's good. That's good. So, uh, a friend of mine, because I put it on Facebook, a friend of mine said, that's easy for me. <laughs> I'm always afraid. <laughs> Do one thing every day that makes you scared. The, the fruit is where you feel the fear. If you begin to take this and apply it into your life this week, it will change you, these, these things. Uh, the Bible says, you know, the great Psalm 23, David, the Lord is my shepherd. And he, in one of the lines, it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. All around me looks scary. And Jesus says, come, sit down and eat. This is where I've brought you to receive from me. The fruit is where you feel the fear. Fear could be like, whoa, hey, this is an opportunity. Panic. 
telling you, I never thought I would talk in front of people. This was the last place that I ever wanted to be. And I, even, you know, I would, I, a lot of you remember like 20 years ago or 18 years ago, me playing guitar. Every Sunday, I would like vomit or feel really sick. I would have issues in the bathroom. Why? I was like afraid. I was like panicked. Some of you can relate. Like that was just me. And so for years, and now I still have like, I would say I have butterflies and I still get nervous and stressed, but I keep going <laughs> because the fruit is so often in the place where you feel the fear. You can lose opportunities because you're like, I'm too scared. I can't do that. So do you know, there's you ever seen um, scarecrows out in the fields? They put the scarecrows out in the fields. Why? To scare the crows. Do you know that scarecrows only work because crows are stupid? That's a word I'm not supposed to say. Don't tell my kids. Scarecrows are... They, they only work because crows are dumb. Why? Because the fruit is where you feel the fear. The smart crow looks at where the scarecrows are because all the fruit is where the scarecrow is going to be. If there's no scarecrow, there's probably no reason to, for the farmer to scare them. But if there's a scarecrow there, that's where I need to go. If you allow these things to enter into your life, they will transform you, your experience and the results that you receive in your life. You only go to new places with God by faith. And in order to walk by faith, you got to see differently. And do you see? Number four, momentum is in the moment. If you see it once, it's yours from then on. Th this, this is an interesting one. If you see it once, sometimes we think like breakthrough is like a one-time thing, but actually breakthrough is meant to be an ongoing experience. So that first time that I stood behind a, whatever this thing is called, the next time it got, I don't know, it didn't feel much easier, but it did. It got a little easier. And the third time, I didn't just say, okay, well, thank you, God. You gave me the grace to do it that one time. And well, Moving on, I'll never do that again. Because momentum is in the moment. Breakthrough, your breakthroughs can become, you know, there's that new phrase, the new normal. Well, don't think of it in terms of viruses and masks and stuff. Think of it in terms of the kingdom of God. Those breakthroughs can become your new normal. So awesome. This is the journey of walking with God by faith, step by step. We think we got to just get it all, and then we're so discouraged when it all just doesn't come, and when actually this is the journey, this is actually the way that it works. It's like small, awkward, little by little. Even Jesus said it, the kingdom of God's like this little bit of yeast, and pretty soon it begins to work its way out through the whole thing. It's had such, it's like a little mustard seed. It just, and then it grows and it becomes this big thing. Momentum is in the moment. But you gotta take that. So, you know, I remember, I'll give you some examples. Or, um, People with addictions that get free of addictions because I've gone, I've been involved in a number of these homes. One of them in Tipperary, and then I w went to one in uh, Italy, Naples, Italy. So I just always found it so interesting that these guys that would come and girls that would come off heroin, they would get freed and like 
supernaturally, like God would do amazing things. They didn't have any like methadone or anything. They would just get off of it. And then they, but what was amazing to happen was that the guys that had experienced getting off it and the women that experienced getting off of heroin, they would be always be the ones that would sit with the other ones that were going to get off of it. Because they had had their breakthrough. And that breakthrough that they experienced was actually enabled them to share that breakthrough with another. They, they could be like, hey, I was here last week. I know you feel like you're going to die. It's 2 a.m., but I'm with you. You can do this. And they just would just experience this breakthrough. It's amazing what God would do. They, they wrote a book about the ones in Italy, and the book was called We Dance Because We Cannot Fly these drug addicts that had been freed from their addiction and then they would begin to praise God and you just see him totally free praising God and we're just the reason that we're so crazy wild dancing is because we can't fly <laughs> we'd be even more wild so the breakthrough is meant to become your new normal with God you know and this this could be people in this church have you know they've prayed for one person and that person has been like healed of a migraine and so then they prayed for, they found another person that had a migraine. They prayed for them. What happened? That person ended up getting healed from a migraine. And then they found a third person. So, but again, it's not like every time 100%, like it just happens for sure. But begin to go on that journey. Hey, I got free of that. I remember when God did that. I'm going to take that with me now and try it again bring this breakthrough. There's so many different wa ways we can do this. Um, you, I'm sure you've experienced things in God and you think, well, that was just a once-off thing, but actually that's meant to be shared. Somebody blessed you in a profound way. And now you can take that experience and you can do the same thing for somebody else. So profound. It could be a lot of things. It could be generosity. You remember you didn't have enough groceries and you had no money, you didn't have a job, and somebody just showed up at your door with a bag of groceries, all of a sudden, that's mine! I'm going to take that and change somebody else's life just like God changed my life through that small act of kindness. So many different things. It could be the fact that you've experienced the unconditional love of God. Hey, do you know that God loves you? You know, you're sitting talking to that taxi driver. You look pretty sad today. Can I just tell you, God loves you so much. He loved me, and I was this, 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 this. God loves you. Do you know an, a great name for God? You're talking to the taxi driver. Maybe you should just start calling him unconditional love, because that's who he is. He loves you unconditionally. No matter what you did on Saturday night, God loves you. He'll tell you the truth sometimes, because he wants the best for you. And that might be uncomfortable, but he loves you. You are so amazing. He would do everything because he loves you. Die for you. Everything. This is unconditional. So, okay, those are the four things. Let's look at this final scripture, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 to 12. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his spirit. Do you see that? There are things that God has hidden for you that he des desires to reveal to you and me. Will you stand up? <clears throat> Can we just pray for a moment? You just put a hand on your heart maybe today if I was there with you I would put a hand on your head just to pray for you um, Lord as we're here I just want to pray for us Lord that you would place a desire to perceive within us place a desire to see not just the temporary but to see and look at the eternal 
And thank you, Lord. It's not just about the things. It's not just about the miracles or any of that stuff. Actually, the faith is, it's really faith is seeing you, God. And so I pray you put a desire within us to see you more clearly. And Lord, where there is discouragement, unbelief, where those things have begun to choke out your reality in our lives, Lord, that you would just release us from those bonds, those discouragements, those cares, those anxieties. And thank you. It's by the, the Holy Spirit. These things God has revealed to us through his spirit. Thank you, Lord, that you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Uh, we just we go out of this place, Lord, with a smile on our face, excited about what you, you're going to do. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. It's not just for us, it's for others too, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.